Hi folks. On the clock is an expression we are all familiar with. It can mean different things to different people. If you request a taxi and they pick you up and take you to your destination, you are on the clock or on the meter. The miles that you travel will tally up and you will be expected to pay for the cost of the trip in the end. If you are at work on the job, you are also considered to be on the clock. Your boss expects you to be performing the duties associated with your particular job. In exchange for the effort and hard work, you will be rewarded by your company for your service at the end of your assigned pay period. Finally, if you're at a sporting event, let's say a basketball game for example, the players, coaches, referees, and fans are all interested in what is left on the clock. If a team is behind, they are feverishly trying to make the most of the remaining time on the clock to maximize their chance of victory. If a team is ahead, they may be trying to use the time left on the clock to keep their opponent from scoring while holding on to the ball as long as possible in the process. Either way, it is important to know how much time is left on the clock. Like it or not, we're all on the clock. That's right, we're all on the clock. Just like all the examples we discuss, there are three specific components to being on the clock. Those things are time, responsibilities, and outcome. And since we are on the clock, it is critical for us to understand each one of those three things and how it affects us. The first factor we want to talk about is time. Time can be hard to define sometimes. It can mean a whole lot of things to a whole lot of different people. Here are some of the ways Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines time. The measured or measurable period during which an action, process, or condition exists or continues. Duration. A non-spatial continuum that is measured in terms of events which succeed one another from past through the present to the future. The point or period when something occurs. Occasion. An appointed, fixed, or customary moment or hour for something to happen, begin, and end. A historical period or age. A division of geological chronology. Conditions at the present or at some specified period. The present time. Lifetime. A period of apprenticeship. A term of mil military service. A prison sentence. Season. A moment, hour, day, or year is indicated on a clock or a calendar. One of a series of recurring instances of re or repeated actions. Finite as contrasted by an infinite duration. <laughs> That's a fun one, isn't it? A person's experience during a specific period or a particular occasion. The hours or days recognized to be occupied by one's work. An hourly pay rate. Wages paid at, the dis at discharge or resignation. The playing time of a game, a period during which something is used or is available to use. <laughs> See, those are all interesting definitions of time. Where else can we turn to find out about time? How about my favorite place to look? What does the Bible say about time? We're going to look in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a 
time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set out eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom, fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. For each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added and nothing taken from it. God does it so, people, so that people will fear Him. Whatever is has already been and whatever will be has been before and God will call the past to account and I saw that everything else under the sun in this place of judgment wickedness was there in this place of ju justice wickedness was there and I said to myself God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked for there will be a time for every activity a time to judge every deed I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that, they may, so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like the animals. The, the same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so, uh, so the other dies. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place, from dust to dust, and to dust return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward or if the spirit of the animal goes down to the earth. And so I say that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? <clears throat> the writer of Ecclesiastes sounds a little bit tired. Like someone with a little bit more time here on the earth. Someone with experience and wisdom. The good thing about time is that God is always there for all of it. He has always been and always will be. For us, there are seconds, moments, events, days, seasons, and lifetimes involved with time. There is the time we have already used, the, the here and now, and the time that is ahead of us. There is a time that we have been here in this life, and there is a time that is beyond it. Time is both finite and limitless. We can be running out of time, or we can have all the time in the world. Time can be viewed as precious or disposable depending on how you use it. We often look at time in terms of our experience. We have good times and bad times, happy times and sad times. Sometimes we categorize time in terms of the effort involved, easy times and challenging times. Regardless of our personal definitions, we know how much time, we never know how much time we have left in this world. James chapter 4 puts it this way, beginning with verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know 
what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is God's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. For anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. This brings us to the second factor in being on the clock. Responsibilities. Responsibilities are based on the passage we let, read in James chapter 4. We have responsibilities associated with being on the clock. And look at verses 15 to 17. It says, Instead we ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in arrogance in your arrogant schemes. All of such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. <clears throat> Our first and primary responsibility is to do God's will. God created us the way He did for with a specific purpose in mind for us. Each and every one of us uh, were create were custom made and uniquely equipped for that purpose. As God reveals His will for us in our lives, it is our responsibility to follow His direction for our lives. Just as a coach instructs the players on the court on what to do, or when to do it, God gives us all directions. Many of those directions are written down in His Word, the Bible. We read His Word not for entertainment, but for guidance and insight into how we live our lives. We listen to His voice through the Holy Spirit who points us in the direction that we need to go and steers us away from a path that we are not to travel. We go to Him in prayer asking for assistance, better attitudes, strength, perseverance, clarification, and understanding in order to fulfill our purpose and please Him. We stay in constant and close contact with Him. We listen to His every word, treat it like a treasure, and faithfully do what He says. We do not put on the jersey of the other team. We do not invite their, but we do invite their players to join God's team instead. We are proud of being His. We are proud of being His faithful children. We serve not out of duty, but out of love. Each and every moment of each and every day, we are to be about His business. He has times for us to do particular things for Him. Back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says, there is a time for everything, a season for everything, every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. See how it goes from one to the other? It bounces back and forth. It's almost like a clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. Do you feel it? A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain uh, from and to and to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to aid, a time for war, and a time for peace. 
our individual tasks can change from time to time, but our overall responsibility is to do His will. Let me say that again. Our individual tasks can change from time to time, but our overall responsibility is to do His will. We have many things to do, and the clock is ticking. These are our responsibilities. We need to embrace them and be happy in them. Remember what it says in verse 13 of this passage in Ecclesiastes. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live. Further down in verse 22 it says, And so I saw that there is nothing better for a person to than, than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. Learn to do His will and to be happy about doing it. Do not complain and, or point and say, that's not my responsibility, that's somebody else's. It's not my job. Let others see Jesus in you. Spread his love everywhere you go. Paul tells us about this in Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse nine. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. There's that doing good and what is good again. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So there it is again. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Seriously? It says that, folks. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay any one evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Remember we talked about doing the right thing. It says it again there. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the, on, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning holes, holes on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do his will and do what is good. Be loving, be happy, be joyful. <laughs> Praise Him as you serve Him. Be about His business. Perhaps you've wandered away from your responsibilities for a while, or maybe even for a long time. You say you're a Christian, but you have been living a lot you haven't been living the life of an obedient child maybe you've even taken your jersey off and cast it aside it's not too late to find your way back to him jesus tells of someone who walked away from it all in luke chapter 15 he tells this story verse 11 there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between him. Long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in 
need. He went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Oh, how far he had wandered from the wealth that his father had get, had. And he told his father, I want my inheritance now. I wish you were dead. And look at where he was now. And that would be the end of the story if a lot of folks told it. But Jesus says, And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And I am starving to death. And I will sit out. And I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Are you there right now? Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants so he got up and he went to his father but while he was a long way off his father saw him <laughs> his father saw him while he was a long way off do you think maybe that his father had been looking for him for a long time that he'd been scanning the horizon looking for his son to come back home? I think so. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. <laughs> think how undignified that would have been for the father. Yet he ran. He ran like he'd never run before. He ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. <laughs> and it's one of the sweetest pictures in the Bible on how wonderful it is to, for us to return to the Lord. And it said, But the father said to his servants, Quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Are you afraid? that God will look down on you? Are you afraid that Jesus will look down on you if you don't, if you return to him after all that you've done? Are you ashamed? Absolutely you're ashamed, but does, will he accept you and will he love you? Yes, he will. If you've fallen away or failed to carry out your responsibilities, it's not late, too late for you to turn it all around and find your way back to the path that God intended for you all along. Do not wait any longer, folks. The clock is ticking. And there is only so much time left on the clock. Maybe you claim to be a Christian, but you're not really putting any effort into it. You're basically faking it at this point. You've wandered more like sneaked away quietly hoping no, no one would notice the clock is still ticking for you as well listen to his words in the book of Revelation Revelation 3 beginning with verse 1 I know your deeds you have a reputation of being alive but you are dead wake up strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I found your deeds unfinished in sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. 
But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come for you. The day is coming when he will return. Do not wait until it's too late. Do not wait until it's too late to find your way. He still loves you and wants you to return home where you belong. He waits for you with his arms wide open. Return to him, his love, and his path for your life. And finally, there is the outcome of being on the clock. The outcome for the rider of the cab is to pay the fare and reach their destination. The outcome for the worker is to complete their assigned task and receive compensation or pay for the job that they have done. The expected outcome for the players and coaches and fans is victory and joy. For those who fall short on the scoreboard, there's defeat and, and sorrow as they watch the victors celebrate. For us, while this may be short-term rewards, the ultimate goal is to, is to cross the finish line on the streets of gold in the presence of our Savior and King. For those who rode through life in faith and obedience, the cost of your fare has been paid by the blood of Jesus. His blood covers the sinful side trips through sin where you stumbled along the way, but repented and asked for forgiveness. For the believer, the destination is sweet and eternal. The journey for service is quite, re is quite rewarding on its own as we serve Him, but it pales in comparison to what waits for us at our destination on the other side in heaven. Oh, what a day that will be when Jesus we will see face to face, joy upon joy, forever and ever, for all eternity. For those who rode on the path of sin but failed to accept Him as Lord and Savior, the cost of the fare is entirely different. You see the difference between the two fares in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which trip are you on now? You have a choice to make between the two paths. Which path are you on? What is your goal in this life? Romans, uh, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 23 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but store up yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart? What is your destination? Who will pay your fare? The choice is yours. The clock is ticking. Be ready to forgive if, and accept Him as Lord and Savior. Do not wait until it's too late to ask for His forgiveness. Run to Him now. He waits for you. We are all on the clock. Our time in this world is precious and fleeting. We have no guarantee that there will be a tomorrow for us here in this life. The Lord may call us home at any time. It is our responsibility to do God's will with the time that we have left. Make the most of each and every moment that we have and live every day as if it was our last. Sprint toward the finish line, knowing that great is your reward in heaven. Look forward to the day where there will be no more sadness, sorrow, or pain, only rejoicing for all eternity in the presence of our Savior and King. Hallelujah. I will leave you with the final words from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. It gives, it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Time to spread the word, folks. We're on the clock.
Let's go to work.